we're so curious about each other. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Like memoirs are popular because we want to know what other people are experiencing, what they've had to overcome or what, you know, like their big lessons have been. Or we just want a funny story, you know, like we're, we're interested in each other. Despite everything going on in the world, we're still interested in each other's lives. And that's very beautiful to me. Welcome to Invisible Not Broken. Today, we are talking about creativity, technology, emergency rooms, and pacing your work in a hustle-driven culture. Our host, Monica, is joined by award-winning author, editor, and cartoonist, Alyssa Graybill, who lives with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I was diagnosed when I was 10 years old, which is really early compared to a lot of people's journeys. However, in 1992, there was so much less knowledge and treatment about EDS, even less than there is now. So I kind of didn't really get any treatment at that time. And But the emotional thing that really happened is I, I remember making a vow to myself that I was not going to let EDS affect me. I was, I was just going to live my life and I was just going to ignore it. And I was going to mind over matter it. And, you know, I was 10. So I was just like, I, I can do this. It doesn't matter. And um, very much at that time, I had also I had, I had just learned about prediction for the apocalypse of 2012. And I really, you know, I took it to heart. I have a degenerative condition, but I'm going to die when we turn th- when I turn 30. Like, we're all going to die. So, it's, like, maybe I can last till I'm 30, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like I really, I very much internalize that. And it seems so silly in retrospect because, I mean, obviously, we did not die. We're, we're still here. And around that time, 2012, 2013, I was really hitting a wall with my health, too. And... I really hit a point where I could no longer ignore it. So the book is about in the process of kind of coming back to that and kind of learning how to take care of myself. Really, it's about the first stages of recognizing and, and unlearning internalized ableism. Because oh, of that one. Yeah, and it runs so deep in all of us and it's so hard to see. And obviously the long process and I don't think it ever really ends. But I mean, that first step of just like, what my body is experiencing matters. This chronic pain matters. I don't have to go at this, this in the speed. I don't have to do it this way. Like just like that basic recognition that my embodied realities matter. That's basically what the book is about. And it's amazing. I, I'm dying to get my hands on it. I've only gotten to see little bits of it around on the web, but I am definitely going to be buying this for after we finish talking. Ken is insanely young to get diagnosed. Like even when I took my kids in to get to an EDS specialist, they're like, we don't diagnose this early. How did you get that diagnosis? And also you're like one of the first people I've talked to who was sick as a kid. And it's such a different experience when you're kind of like at that age of immortality. Nothing's going to hurt you. You can take on the world if you want. And your body's like, yeah, that's that's not a thing. You'll take on the world in a different way. Yeah. Uh, how is that to be a sick kid? And how are you able to get a diagnosis young? So I have classical EDS. And I think that's a little bit easier to diagnose young because I have like very characteristic skin. Oh, okay. That's particularly soft and stretchy. And I, I got diagnosed by fluke. I was in the emergency room all the time as a kid because I would fall just constantly. And whenever I would fall, I would hit and hit my shins, they would split open. And so by the time I was maybe 12, I'd had like 300 something stitches, various emergency room visits. So, and nobody really knew it was happening. You know, they just thought I was a clumsy kid. And then I was, then I went to a different room, emergency room and I happened to be treated by a doctor who knew ehlers Danlos syndrome. So he came in and he like bent my fingers all around and did the mic like, you know, all the pulling and pushing tests of all the joints. And he's like... He turned to my mom and he says, do you know this, this child has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? And you know, my mom was like, no, nobody knows this. What are you talking about? And that sort of initiated the process that I got a clinical diagnosis from there. Didn't get the genetic testing until much later. It was, it was very lucky. It was very flukish. If we hadn't have run across that doctor, I would have been in that decades long process everyone else <laughs> seems to be in to get some answers. I had answers at that time. I just, I just ignored them completely. It's a different gas fighting like gauntlet you have to go through. You know, it's either yourself or it's the world or it's full. I, I feel like both chronic illness are great to double gaslight. I mean, if the world isn't going to gaslight, we're going to gaslight ourselves harder. Oh my God, yes. It's like that insulting yourself sort of thing. Like if I do it harder, then whatever they do out there won't be nearly as bad. Exactly. Yeah. 
So when you were a kid, were you into the drawing and writing? I feel like a lot of us who are chronically ill kids, like we got really into creativity as a way to filter. Well, I definitely feel like the creativity is my main coping, you know, filter now as an adult. As a kid, I loved writing. Mm -hmm. I loved writing. I loved art. Mostly my escape was reading. It wasn't so much the creative writing or the drawing, but like I was just always, my head was always, always in a book. And so that definitely influenced my trajectory to becoming a writer. But yeah, I mean, having chronic pain as a kid, that's what I remember most acutely. It's just, I was always, I always hurt. Everything just always hurt. I couldn't keep up with the other kids. And, you know, even with my diagnosis, some of the doctors were like, oh, you just need to lose weight. Like, here's how you eat an apple or whatever. I was just like, no, that's not it. But it is, it is a very isolating experience for anybody, for an adult of any age. But as a kid, you know, you're watching other, these other kids run around and like, they fall and whatever, they're fine. And I was like, that, that's not a, it was isolating, I'd say. I think like I did feel like I was definitely different in like lots of weird ways. That's kind of where the freak in the title comes from. I would say, don't think I'm at an actual freak, but that's the mean voice in my head, especially as a kid. I was just like, I just, you know, I'm not right in all the ways. I was looking at all the other kids saying, how are you humaning? Like how, <laughs> how, I don't like, I was an only child too. And it was just adults around me. So like, how, how are they able to be good at this people thing? Right. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, just all the energy that still astounds me when I watch able-bodied people like go about their days. I'm like, do you have any idea how much energy you're wasting? Like, it's, it's incredible to me. It's amazing. Oh my God. Yes. Look, <laughs> we live in the hills, And like when we drive anywhere, it's like, I see these people just going for a walk for fun or even like when they look mad, like I don't want to be exercising, but I should be. And I'm just looking at them like, I know I shouldn't be jealous. I know I shouldn't be like, how dare you? But how dare you? Think about every way my foot falls down. Otherwise, I'm in bed for four weeks. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's such a different, such a different experience. So you talked about pacing a lot. Mm -hmm. I was seeing through a lot of what you've been writing in your blog. And you talk about pacing in life and in work. I'm curious because I'm just going to pick your brain as a writer and an artist. How? How are you yeah. able to do these things? How do you pace yourself? I don't know about you, but I'm an artist too. And my wrist pops out all the time. So how are you able to handle these big projects and deadlines? Because you also run an editing business. So I'm guessing you have some deadlines. How can you pace yourself with deadlines and things that need to get done when your body's like, yeah, I'd rather hang out with the cat? Well, I mean, it, that's, it's a hard one, no matter how. That's why I think I write about it so much because it's because I feel like I have so much to say about it just in my own learning process. But oh, I'll start with the day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day pacing. I, oh, I just want to say really quick, though, that like my baseline is I always just want to be in bed with the cats. So there's, you know, there's never any time when that's not my, my preference. But, do, you know, I heard about pacing. People often throw out the word pacing and it just has no meaning, you know, like, <laughs> what are you supposed to do with that? Like, you have your job, you do have the deadline. How are you supposed to do it? But for me on a day-to-day -day basis, it means that I just break up my work a lot. Like I'll do half an hour, an hour of my creative work or my editing work. And then I'll go do something that uses a different part of my body you know, that uses my brain or uses my soul or whatever I, I feel needs to be used at that time. So that I am just really toggling back and forth all the time. I feel like I'm always doing two things and I'm kind of just back and forth, back and forth so I can stop, go back. And I feel like in the creative process, I find that so incredibly helpful and useful because so many of the good ideas come when you're not actively working on this one thing and not taking a break. You know, like if you don't come up for air, the ideas have nowhere to land. You just have to take that space. In the creative process, the pacing is critical too. So I feel lucky actually that I've had to learn how to pace really well because it feeds my creative work and it helps my body. But I definitely don't have one big answer. You know, like when you have a joint that's giving out, I mean, it's just giving out and you just have to stop. You know, like you don't, there's not like a quick fix for that or like a strategy that really, it's just, ugh, it's just hard. It's frustrating. I, I was a ballerina for years and years and I'm not supposed to get to this part now. Um, the pushing through, there's some sort of weird morality in our culture, in our world, especially when as a ballerina of pushing through pain. Pain is weakness leaving the body is like that famous thing. And there's no disability and a bad attitude, BS, toxic positivity in the world. Uh, the pushing through. I come from a family that like absolutely lionizes the idea of not taking medication. It is almost a cult-like story of 
my great aunt who broke her hip and only took one aspirin and the uncle who fell off the the house and broke his back and he barely took any medication. He powered through each of his things. And it's about mind over matter for a lot of people. And my body is body over mind. And that becomes a really weird twist, especially in the sort of like kill it world of like hustle culture and get things done. It's this weird mythology around this push through pain. But for I'm guessing you and also I have EDS type three plus pushing through pointing at something means that I'm giving attraction for a while. <laughs> so, yeah. the, the idea of like morning routines and killing it, like how are you dealing with all of those things? Are you able to buffer all that noise out? How do you keep from gaslighting yourself that you're not as sick as you think you are when you have a deadline looming? I do that a lot. I do a lot of gaslighting. Of, I can, it's, it's not that bad. It'll be fine until I end up on the ground. Yeah. I mean, in all honesty, I still do it sometimes because it's just so hard not to when you're trying to do big things or big projects. I do think the big thing is I've gotten a lot more patient with myself. So if I do have to ask for an extension or if I I build in a lot of extra time around everything that I do, like I, I don't work last minute. I always try and work early and and that can get you so far and it can't get you all the way sometimes, but being kind to yourself, it's such a cliche to say it ever, you know, it's kind of all over Instagram, you know, like love yourself, blah, blah. Yeah. But it's really difficult, especially if you have a chronic illness and you're trying to live your life and you know. okay, so there's the patience thing. So I had a big health scare a few years ago. So I have classical EDS and I also have Marfan syndrome, which is a related connective tissue disorder. I'm sure you know this, but like, wow, classical EDS affects collagen, Marfan affects fibrillin, which are both connective tissue things. So some of my symptoms are a little bit more like the vascular EDS type and that I have got, I have vascular episodes in the sense that in summer of 2020, I had a vertebral artery dissection, which is like when an artery split open, like one of the layers in your artery has a tear and blood gets in it and creates, it kind of balloons up and makes a blood bubble what they call transient ischemic strokes. I hope I'm saying that right. So I had a bunch of strokes in the summer of 2020. So I almost died. It was a big deal. It took a long time to heal. I was having recurrent strokes like regularly for up to a year, about a year. So, I mean, that was such a big experience that I often come back to that. Just like if I push myself, I could trigger that again. So I really like, it feels very life and death to me to like really try and pace myself. And what triggered that dissection was pushing through, was pushing myself on a day that I was tired. I was out in the sunshine. I'm allergic to the sun. And it was hot. And I was like running up a sand dune. And like I needed to get away from the people because I was too hot. So I was just like booking it back to the car, you know. And I and that's what that's what triggered the dissection. So just to, I guess a constant reminder of my mortality is helpful. It's a lot of memento mori on your desk just to remind yeah. you my routines are bullshit. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're bringing up a really interesting idea. You talk about coming home to your body. How do you have confidence in your body? I mean, you quite literally almost died from running up the hill. A lot of us, you know, like, I don't have confidence that if I I took a step over there to close that door, that was a a calculated moment because easily if I stepped wrong way, my leg would go the other way. Like it's we're always having to come back home to our bodies that aren't the way we remembered them or even think that they should be human shaped or anything like that. How are you building the confidence to come back home to your body? Oh my goodness. I just, I don't know that I have an answer because I'm the same way. You know, you just don't look at Joan and all these And it's okay to not have an answer. We could just talk about how crazy that is. No, I do have something to say. Like, I do think that I used to be a little control free because of that specific issue. You know, like at any moment, everything could fall apart. And I've gotten a lot less that way, kind of being like, well, if I fall, yeah, it's inevitable. And as they know, at the end of the world, I've loosened up a bit just because of the inevitability of that all. I also want to bring that back to the book, actually, because what I did in the book in terms of structuring it, which I think is hopefully going to be fun for people, is that I go back and forth. The chapters kind of toggle back and forth between childhood and adulthood. So I wanted the reader to have the experience of that kind of jarring unpredictability. You know, like, oh, I thought I was living this life, this experience, whatever. And then all of a sudden I'm in a different time. Different things are happening because that is how it's like, you know, like we, whether physically like we are walking and all of a sudden we are not walking or moving and falling. 
or that we think we're on a specific career track. And then all of a sudden we have a health flare and it, our lives are totally different. It's just like, can I swear on this podcast? Oh, absolutely, please. <laughs> it is such a mind suck. Mm. It is such like, you know, you always, you don't always know where you're going to be an hour from now or a day from now. So I really wanted the book to be disjointed. I wanted it. And it's sort of a secret thing. I guess I didn't really talk about it that much to my publisher, even in the blurb, but like just to amuse myself. I wanted readers to be like, oh, this is like, where am I? I feel disoriented. Like this is, this is hard. Hopefully people with chronic illness will read it and will be like, oh, this feels familiar. I'm just uh, back and forth and it all comes together in the end. But maybe the trajectory is not so obvious how we're going to get there. And that's the flexibility of disability. I'm on my fifth, sixth career now. And it's just because I, I health out at each career. And there's there's a crazy amount of you just have to see what's next. And it's like we have this idea of who we are. And if that's too rigid, like what you're talking about being a control freak, that becomes very dangerous. I was a photographer. I couldn't do that anymore. I was a painter. I stand for canvases anymore. I was a jeweler. I certainly couldn't do that anymore. And then it became this, well, I'm not those professions. I'm a storyteller. Okay, well, now we can start working like what that next iteration is. Is that like that for you where you're like, I had to get like, I had to get to the heart of like who and what I actually was to find how I could slide between careers. Yeah, absolutely. And the sort of creative storyteller as someone who can work in very different mediums at whatever speeds it, that needs to go. Yeah, that has definitely been very helpful because even if I am switching careers or a different my work life looks different and my creative work looks different even just having that as like that feeling I guess as an anchor in that creativity like I'm a creative person I'll figure things out because I always do but yeah it, it's it's really interesting how many people with chronic conditions and disabilities are such amazing creatives and who I mean it becomes an integral part of your life and I love that like I don't think I can't think of any person anyone who I know personally who has a chronic condition who doesn't have a big creative practice. It's just fascinating. And we are great people to hire if you can give us the accommodations. And that's one thing I'm hating watching as the work from home is going away. Such an opportunity for us to join and be a part of things. And they decided that their culture of cubicles was more important. Yeah, very sad. We really need to learn how to get things done efficiently. And I don't want to like valorize efficiency as like the end, you know, value in life. But in a job, we can, I think we can do things a lot more efficiently than able-bodied people because we we work when we're able to work. Not, you know, we're not just showing up on a bad day and kind of dicking around for however long, you know, like which I think a lot of people do at work sometimes. But if we're at home and we can work when we need to work and we can focus and we like we're like we got I got two hours of energy today and this is what I'm going to do. And then you, I do think we make fantastic employees too. I agree. I think so. I think we make fantastic a lot of things. Like, I feel like I'm a fantastic mom. And my my child now, well, one's a grown adult who lives right by you. And another one is a, is a teenager. And they've told me that they really love all the time they got to spend with me because they got really sick when they got to be teenagers. Mm -hmm. So I was home and in bed and they got so much time of like hanging out. And like, none of my friends get to hang out with their moms like this. So I think there are some weird upsides. Yeah. Like, I think my kids learned a lot of like empathy and, you know, my, my oldest could make dinner and do laundry. I think this, you know, when no one's around to do all those things for you, it becomes life skills. I really want to talk about your space. How do you set up your drawing space? Because I saw on your Instagram feed, some very cool drawing. First off, a darling cat and I'm obsessed with cats and a really cool like thing off the side of your bed that comes over. How do you set up your workspace so that you can work when you're having a flare? Yeah, so that ergonomic system that I set up a few years ago, that was after, that was after the stroke when I, I couldn't sit up without triggering another stroke. I was kind of had to be lying down for almost a year. So that's when I had the computer hovering above my head on this big, heavy arm and, and then the keyboard just on my lap. Now I, I can sit up, as you can see, but I do often need to be sitting in my recliner with my feet up. So if I'm doing just editing work or often if I'm doing a Zoom session with clients, I'll be in my recliner, just in that sort of ergonomic zero gravity position. Drawing is definitely harder. If I'm sketching, it doesn't really matter so much. I can still be in my chair. But I just I just got a regular drawing desk with a tilted tabletop and I do it in little stints. I do have to be wearing my thumb splint when I draw because it's so easy to dislocate. 
talking to another stainless person where you're like, yeah, you don't draw and your thumb just sort of comes out of its joint and just ends up <laughs> on the other side of the paper. That's fine. Yeah. 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 Do you draw on the iPad or? I do both now. Um, lately, it's been primarily the iPad, but I, I'm still doing a lot on paper because I love the texture of watercolor, sort of ink. And like, I, I just can't, I just can't do that digitally. There's, there's no joy in that at all. I tend to do a little hybrid of like, maybe I'll do the line work on my iPad and then I'll do the um, watercoloring on paper and then I'll kind of merge the two layers. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of both. Oh, it's so beautiful. That's really cool. Yeah. And watercolor, you know, that's easy on the hands. You can barely, you can barely have to touch the page with that brush. It's sort of a weird magic. Like I, a watercolor is like half chaos, half, you can't even bother planning. It's like light. It's like you kind of think where you know what you want to make. And then the watercolor is like, yeah, sure. But we're going to do this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I never thought about that before. It is totally in line with that unpredictability of what's happening day to day. I, I run the parenting teenagers, so my entire life is unpredictability. I'm just going to throw that out there. I'm interviewing right now. Apologies on that. So I did want to talk about the emergency rooms because that was my fear as a parent with two kids who are not diagnosed, but definitely dislocated. And then when I'd go in, they'd look to my husband because this comes out all the time. And that's a, a very common dislocation for abuse victims, which I am not, but it was this weird thing in, in emergency rooms where like when I was a kid, I was in and out all the time and they were looking at my parents like, why why is your healthy looking child so sick? And then bringing my own kids in with their own problems. It was like, well, really not hurting them, I swear. So what can we do with emergency rooms so that they can ask better questions, help diagnose people properly instead of the send you home with hysteria or not notice the signs? Oh, that's such a big I question. I was sent home with hysteria more times than I can count. Yeah, for sure. I get that a lot as well. Well, Victorian mode. I mean, I faint if I stand, I barely move. And, you know, I am obviously hysterical, wandering well from all that reading. God damn it. Right. Do you have conversion disorder? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. I mean, I remember getting asked those questions too in the emergency room, like doctors taking me inside and being like, do you know, are your parents... Are you safe at home sort of thing? And the thing is too, and if you are an abused child, you're you're not going to answer that. Maybe. Actually, like not if your parents are in the room. Like they did that to me with my husband in the room. And I was like, if I was, would I answer that in front of him? Like, Right. It's just a fail all the way around, no matter the situation. And I don't know that I have a good answer for that, honestly. I mean, aside from believing people when they talk, I mean... How do we make that fundamental? How do we make it fundamental that believing patients' experiences is critical to the process of medicine and treatment? And if we could change the pain scale from the like silly face pain scale to Ali Brosh's pain scale, I would be very happy <laughs> with that at least. At least it would make me laugh because I'm actually being mauled by a bear should be a pain scale level. Yeah, I didn't realize that pain scale of being mauled by the bears was Ali Brosh. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I have her books. I love her work. Actually, my next book is I want to be doing something similar in terms of the hybridity of that, like oh a paragraph of the comic thing. Yeah, I really love her. She's totally an inspiration. So I don't know how I missed that was her, but I do know that pain scale and I love it. My partner is actually a naturopath and she has that pain scale oh. up on her wall in, in her office. <laughs> I already like her. I, Ali Brosh is like, if, if anyone's looking like for a recommendation on mental health, Ali Brosh did the best explanation I've ever seen for medical depression, mm-hmm. chemical depression. Like that was, I, I brought that to my dad who's a therapist when I was, or was a therapist when I was going through depression. I'm like, this is literally what this feels like. Like I cannot explain it any better, but this is it. Like mm-hmm. that's, I think one of the things about the, what you do that I really love is your combining of the visuals of the comic with your writing. Like I, I love that style of it. And it, it shows what's happening while still leaving enough room for the person who's looking at it to bring their own experience in. Right, for sure. And that's what I love so much about comics as a medium. And Ali Brash really brings that home because you look at her drawings and they're very simple, but they communicate so much. And the thing that's so amazing to me about comics is like the more figurative that you draw, like the more simply, the more people can project onto it and like identify with your drawings and, and identify with the story. And that just that never ceases to amaze me. That life's the less realistic you draw, the more powerful your comics are. Isn't that interesting? It's the same mm-hmm. with children's books. Like I have, I, I collect children's picture books and the ones where it's beautiful, like it's, it's high art fantasy things. And 
those are not the books my kids wanted to look at. They wanted Good Night Moon. And oh, we have this great little witch book, but it was all like really goofy, silly, cute drawings. And they're very simple, but um, just didn't gravitate towards like the Michelangelo level drawings. That was not their thing. Yeah. So for for you and what you're doing with your flares and you are doing a lot, do you have any tech things? I'm ridiculously invested in technology, mentally, not financially. I have no money placed on a receiving. Mm-hmm. But I'm very interested in how technology is able to level the playing field. Like we've seen with virtual reality, we can actually do in-person therapy in virtual reality. We can do in-person doctor visits. We can do roundtable discussions with anyone. I use a billion apps to remotely keep me looking semi-human and Procreate, which is the worst name ever for a drawing app, is my favorite drawing app. They have a ton of adaptive and assistive technologies behind the app. So the UI is created for people who have limb differences and who have, I can't draw for very long. So I use that symmetry tool, 247. All of my drawings are symmetrical because I cannot take the time to do the other side. But yeah. Gosh, what what kind of things do you use technology-wise or, or gadget-wise that allow you to create, draw, edit, write. I mean, I use Scrivener for my writing. I'm not sure I'd recommend it, but that is what I use for my insane ADD to be able to plot a novel. Yeah, this is funny. So I I also use Scrivener. That's how I make sense of my big projects. I've even started using it for non-book things, like to keep track of things. But yeah, you're right. It is it is fairly clunky. And I lose my chapters all the time. It just, it's so bad at saving things. So if you do yeah. I get why it's wonderful, but save. I just yeah, love to exactly. chapter of a novel. Oh, that's brutal. Yes, but it really needed a lot of rework. So I'm trying to practice the things happen for you, not to you. That was after a temper tantrum. It was quite the practice. And like, yes, it's probably it to be rewritten anyway. Yeah. Yeah, we get so used to the auto save now. A scrivener. A scrivener is dangerous, but useful potentially. When I draw on my iPad, I also use Procreate. So we're on the same page there. Have you found a pencil thing that allows you to charge your pencil and allows you to hold your Apple Pencil without cramping your fingers to help? Well, uh, let me see. I do. I have a little, I add a little ergonomic grip me. Ah, yes. One of these. Yep. Those grip um, wonderful. Yeah. So I've uh, always got a bag of those on hand for whatever device I need. I mean, most of my tech is pretty low tech. And that I don't use a lot more than that. When I am working, I use Pomodoro timer. Mm. Because I, I find that 25 minutes at a time on something is really helpful. I can get, I can really focus. Helps me focus rather than going off into all the things that at once. Because I do tend to hyper focus if I'm on something and just like not stop. And then that's where I get into trouble with health when I arrive, you know, I come out of a three hour cocoon and my body's all like, or, you know, tweaked it all in bizarre ways and I... Can't sleep that night or whatever. So yeah, I, I use 24, 25 minutes at a time on the things that I do. So even if I'm doing a bunch in a row, it helps me keep track of just where I am. I like to turn off that really annoying timer. And yeah, I don't have a ton of other adaptive things that I use in my work. I mean, Zoom, of course, has been incredibly helpful. I don't know if it's like this where you are. Are you in the, you're in the UK, right? Oh God, no, I wish. No, I, okay. I live in California. Okay, so I was confused about this. Okay, great. We're on the same coast. Fantastic. Oh. Um, I don't know if it's like this where you are, but doctors seem to be phasing out the virtual visits as well, at least where I am. Like my specialist, my media specialist, I've seen for years virtually now, is no longer seeing. You have my clinic. And so that's the brutal one because to get in the car is agony, to get out of the car is dislocations, to do their pee drunk tests. The last time I did that, I ended up on the ground in their bathroom. Again, it took me six months to get through. And virtual visits are very important for people who dislocate. It's very helpful to not have to get in the car and go for 45 minutes. In yeah. California, I think there's a legislation that's going through that will allow for pain clinics to keep doing virtual visits. Oh, amazing. There's some really good stuff coming through in California on not letting pain clinics drop us or just remove our pain medication. Not nearly enough protection, but at least it's a little better with the opioid hysteria going on. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah, those, you- those virtual goodness. visits are very helpful. I don't know why they're they're fighting against this. Yeah, I don't either. It seems like it would even be more cost effective for them because they can do more. And I think about the rental of a property, like I think that that's a part of it. They're so quiet, and so like I need them to to be quiet. I think my editor's gonna be so mad. So why did you put your headphones on? Because they weren't. So I have dogs that are very loud. So yeah, the online thing, I think it was partly. I know at least why my husband had to go back to work was because they had rented all this property and they needed a reason to rent the property for the tax. 
thing. So I don't think any of this is actually being done for our benefit. I think most of this was absolutely about status quo. Right. And like, we've got these systems here set up and we do not want to change them. I, you know, it just, I, I can't find any good reason because you're right. It would save them money if they had virtual clinics. And I'm surprised that there haven't been some quick moving tech health companies that have jumped in to fill this space and go, we'll do that. Like, Right. Yeah. And I know for therapy, that's been incredible. I just interviewed someone who runs a alcohol clinic on virtual reality. So it's completely anonymous. They change your voice. You can use any avatar. You can have yourself present in any way that makes you feel comfortable. You can have your therapist present in any way that you feel comfortable. So that was really a cool thing to hear about. And like that's that feels like that's where we could go. Like we could get to a place where, you know, people feel safe and comfortable in these therapy doctor appointments. I can understand if you need to like touch or move or take my blood. But other than that, it feels like this could be a much more comfortable experience. Yeah, for sure. I hadn't had I hadn't heard of that with therapy, but you're right. It does open up so yeah. many possibilities for people who are uncomfortable with that sort of exposure emotionally. There's so many. Yeah. And also legally, there's people who, if they admit to some certain problems, will lose their jobs. So this gives them this complete anonymity. And even they can benefit from group therapy because each person presents as they wish to present. And I I just think that's just a fantastic way to allow people to feel very safe and comfy. So for editing, I feel like we're in a very similar vein where we were talking to a lot of different people about a lot of different things with their own chronic illness and disabilities. What are you learning about the benefits of talking about your story of going back and looking through your diagnosis journey or going through and looking at all the things you've gone through and done. Like the benefits to me personally. Yeah. What are you saying? Yeah. Like, I see a lot with like how people feel after they've done an interview here with Invisible Not Broken. And a lot of people feel like, oh, wow, that was really kind of sad to go back and look at some of these things. But this feels helpful to other people. And it would actually like help me remember a few things. And mm-hmm. it was freeing to like kind of not have this locked away. Do you see any of that with like the help of memoir writing and memoir remembering? Oh, for sure. I mean, for me personally, when I was writing this book through the frame of sort of my body and my chronic illness, it really recontextualized so many things in my life. So many things that I had kind of internalized as like things that were wrong about me or mistakes that I had made or times when I was lazy and I just couldn't cut it. But reframing it through that lens really, really helps me to claim my writing voice. Like I do feel like my writing got stronger alongside this whole process, sort of homecoming to my body, but then just making sense of my life in a way that felt true to me, you know, without input from all of the world's neuroses and whatnot. I mean, I've got my own, but Mm -hmm. like, yeah, so I think it's, it's really helpful for individuals, but I also think it's really helpful for communities too to see your experiences reflected in someone else's memoir. I mean, we're so curious about each other. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Like memoirs are popular because we want to know what other people are experiencing, what they've had to overcome or what, you know, like their big lessons have been, or we just want a funny story. You know, like we're, we're interested in each other, despite everything going on in the world, we're still interested in each other's lives. And that's very beautiful to me. And I also think that whether or not you identify with someone's memoir or other things in, in someone's book, it helps you see your own life in a different light. You know, whether you identify or not, I think that memoir is really powerful just in terms of contextualizing yourself in the world, other people in the world. Yeah, I love memoir. I can love it too. I, I never even thought about it that way, but that that's what I fell in love with with literature was the ability to body jump and to live a million lives in one lifetime was to jump into an author's head and see the world through their eyes and and experience a life I've never experienced. So that's a beautiful way of seeing that with memoir is that curiosity because we do. I mean, reality TV would not be a thing if we weren't curious about each other. Yeah, that's exactly. Rated version of reality, but. Yeah, one of one of my writing friends slash writing coach, Jenny Forrester, always puts it like, memoir helps us belong to each other. It helps us belong to the world and belong to each other. And I just love the way she puts that because I think it's so true. And I mean, it's true for all literature too. Any stories, stories make us belong to the world and to each other. I was just reading a thing that our fairy tales are 6,000 years old. And that just hit me with solar plexus. That was my graduate work was in fairy tales. And that idea of like, 
languages that aren't spoken anymore, people we've never met, ancestors we could never trace ourselves back to. Or we're sitting there talking about the same idea of a little girl covered in ash that became like the leader. Like it's this, there's certain truths about ourselves and our struggles that even if we don't experience the same disorders or the same struggles, we do experience struggles. And I think that there are threads that we can still realize that we're all humans. And as humans in this human experience, there are universals. For sure. Yeah. People like to say, oh, we're all the same. As in, I mean, it comes from a good place. I'm trying to say just what you said. We all have value as humans. But the thing is, no, we are all very different. We all have a very different past and way of thinking about things and experiences that happen to us. That does not put a value system on who's more important than who's not. You know, it's just mm -hmm. fairness versus equality. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I do not want to let you go without talking about your cat. I'm not utterly obsessed. And I feel like there's definitely a thread between a lot of us who spend a majority of our lives in bed. I spend probably about like, you know, 80% of my life there and our pets. And like, I have two cats, one who's weirdly attuned to my dislocation. And if I make a certain Yelp sound, which I do when I dislocate, she'll come running from anywhere in the house and jump on that joint. She oh. knows which joint it is. And I thought she was being mean at first, but then I found out that Cats like purr at a frequency that heals. And that's exactly oh, what she does. She curls around the joint and purrs. Like, oh. she, she makes it better. And then yeah. I have a little pug who sits underneath my arm to support my shoulder when I'm watching things. Then I have a 105 pound wolf dog who is quite certain he is, he's not helping, but he really thinks he is. So, what do you have? A, what, what role do your animal play in your disability life? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. They're key. They've all, cats have always been key for me. On the cover of my book, actually, is my late cat who helped me write this book. <laughs> was with me the whole, Sorry, the whole process. Um, yeah. But now I have two other cats who are equally incredible. And one of them is a big, beefy Siamese. I think maybe the biggest cat I've ever seen in person. But he's also the sweetest cat I've ever had, I think, like the most caretaker one. And I got him, we adopted him just before I had my dissection and strokes. Oh. And so for a year straight, I had to be lying down and he was for that year on my chest with his arms wrapped around my neck or like his, his head tucked under my chin. And he was just like, always like, you need to be lying down. You need to be lying down. I think he's tuned in to my pots. Like if my... Yeah. Blood pressure goes really high or that sort of system goes out of walk out of whack he just starts yelling at me and he has the most annoying voice of any cat like it's so loud it's uh oh it's so irritating but he's very he's very in tune to my my every move my other cat that i got at the same time is yeah. also lovely and sweet she's less of a caretaker she's kind of mean but also you know she's She's sweet in her own way it's just on her own time she is she's not a healer i guess we can say but I think just just most of my days are spent alone, save like I'm doing a meeting with a client or something. So just having these like warm little sinks of unconditional love in the house where if I'm like, if my tendency to just be unkind with myself or like harsh about what's happening, it's way tempered by their presence, you know, because I'm always talking to them with unconditional love and they're my babies and, da -da 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 -da. and it's just, it changes the mood tremendously. And if I don't have pets, if I don't have cats around, I just, I don't feel right. Like I, I really literally need them. And they're part of my, part of my ecosystem. I absolutely hear, feel that like without the pets, I, I would not be okay. Like not to say I'm okay now. I am not okay now, but yeah, not okay would look very different without my, my daily pets and my, my lovely teenager who spends lots of time watching stupid reality shows with me. Thank you for coming on and talking with me for all this time. Please go to our website. There will be a button to buy Floppy the book, which I will be doing immediately because I cannot wait to read. I, I got myself through Instagram and it was not nearly enough. So I need to buy the book apparently. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Monica. I will say for your listeners that the book comes out May 30th. So all of you lucky people who just have heard about this for the first time can get your instant gratification. All right, well, thank you so much. Be kind, be gentle, and be a badass. Come back to us soon, and we'll be starting a new section on technology and disability. Keep an eye out for that, and let me know if there is any particular topic you want to cover. I am personally kind of 
Dying to try all the kitchen gadgets and see how to easily start making food without fainting. That should be the name of that, shouldn't it? Making food without fainting. I feel like that's a new like Food Network show. Thank you for joining us today. To find out more about today's episode, including show notes, transcripts, and more, please visit invisiblenotbroken.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also support this show by heading over to our Patreon or by sharing these episodes. We are non-advertising, and our growth is thanks to you listeners. Thank you to our host, Monica and Alyssa, for an incredible conversation. This episode was edited by me, Luke Spine. Last but not least, be kind, be gentle, and be badass.